Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Good afternoon and welcome to VR AR to go. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, a new virtual reality at the New York Times. Graham Roberts is a five-time Emmy Award nominated journalist at the New York Times, focusing on innovation in visual journalism. As the director of immersive platform storytelling, he directs the virtual reality program for NYT VR and leads a team that explores new approaches in video, motion graphics, and virtual augmented reality. Good morning. A quick video. I see desperation, but I also see hope. Thousands of people arriving every day. Just think about how bad it must be in their country that they would pick their families, their children, put them on a raft that barely floats, risking their lives to find a place to live and find a place to be accepted when you find it, you recognize it, and that's when you really start pressing the shutter. I feel it's important to take photographs that are going to make a difference. I'm Tyler Hicks, photojournalist for The New York Times. Thank you for having me. I'm Graham Roberts. Um, thank you for the introduction. 
Uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm the director of immersive platform storytelling at the New York Times. Um, this is a great opportunity to present at SIGGRAPH. It's a conference I've been coming to for a number of years now, and it's really been a huge influence on me. Um, you know, SIGGRAPH is this conference where you learn about all these great technologies, and that technology is incredibly important. But for us, the technology is not really what matters the most. It's really what we can make with that technology that matters. Um, it's the stories that we tell enabled by that technology. It's a really critical time for journalism. The information we are receiving is more fragmented, and it's increasingly easy for fake news uh, to be disseminated. It's also a time when the traditional monetization of news has been upended by changing habits and technology. It's been a challenge to learn how to take full advantage of the many new platforms now available to us as journalists and storytellers. And, um, and learn to access really the unique storytelling opportunities each offers rather than just porting the previous way of doing things. And each advancement uh, really tends to be additive, meaning we still need to you know, maintain a quality print edition, for example, while also producing innovative digital journalism. The challenges, though, have helped really focus our mission to create something unique enough and valuable enough that people will, will be willing to pay for it essentially when so much is available out there for free. Um, and the quality that we offer then has to be that much better. So I'm going to talk about the work that we do in virtual reality today, but I think it's important to put this in context. How and why did we start exploring publishing on this new platform? From a platform perspective, you could easily argue that more has changed in the last decade than in the entire 165 year history of the Times. Um, this has been a really great opportunity for visual journalism. The recent Times ad that I opened this talk with, I think, really sets the stage well for putting this work in context. We have some of the best journalists in the world, in every corner of the world, many risking their lives to bring the important stories of the day to light, uh, or have spent decades learning deeply about a particular subject. When we combine that history and foundation with new platforms and technologies, we have an incredible opportunity to create something um, really compelling and, and necessary. So throughout this 165-year history, we have had an evolving set of tools to transport our readers through powerfully written stories, affecting photography and video, or revealing interactive graphics. Now we have a new tool, virtual reality, that offers, I think, a really compelling opportunity to transport and to create meaning and connections. So our experiments with platforms and technologies over the list, this last decade have really prepared us, I think, to be leaders on this nascent platform. And we've, we've created a dedicated um, product to host these experiences that we call NYT VR. For me, personally, um, my interest in virtual reality really started after I attended SIGGRAPH in Vancouver in 2014. That particular year, I felt like everyone was talking about virtual reality, as well as augmented reality, in a way that I just hadn't quite seen before. It felt like it was the tipping point, um, and you know, finally, for, for these kind of technologies. And I remember, I kind of tried to recreate a slide that I saw that year um, in a talk, which essentially looked like this, that particularly piqued my interest. It was a talk that highlighted why mobile technology was the reason behind why VR was poised to take off and compared the accelerated rate of change mobile had brought to a variety of the components necessary to make VR work and work cheaply. Mobile was increasingly the focus in the Times newsroom as more and more of our audience was reaching our journalism in that way. So I was naturally curious what that bridge might be between mobile and VR and what that would mean for our work. Back in New York, I emphasized that we should start treating this new medium seriously because I felt it could be really important for journalism. We began to build some resources so that we could conduct research into how we might produce this work, from live 360 capture to computer graphics to audio, as well as to distribution, which was maybe the biggest question mark for us. You know, it's not just enough for us to present work at festivals and conferences, as fun as that is. We really need to reach a really large audience. So um, that's not to scale, but um, the idea on how to do this ultimately came out of the New York Times Magazine in 2015. We would take advantage of the fact that everybody was already walking around with VR machines in their pockets with something as simple and cheap 
um, as a folded piece of cardboard and some plastic, Google Cardboard in this instance, we could unlock, unlock that capability and create argue, arguably the biggest VR moment yet in the industry. So in partnership with Google, we sent over a million Google Cardboards to our readers with their weekend paper. Uh, I think Google had produced something like 50,000 of these total at the time of our request. And we were like, how about a million? OK. Um, so this was a really interesting intersection, I think, of legacy media um, and new media. It was ultimately our print distribution channels, our trucks and drivers, you know, that allowed us to introduce the medium of virtual reality uh, to a large audience on a mass scale. So the app we developed can work in both Google Cardboard mode and you know, a smart photo, pho, uh, smartphone mode or magic window mode. And we produced a series of educational elements like this one that would help first time viewers learn how to see uh, the projects with their new cardboards. And um, with that cardboard distribution and our new mobile app, we also released our first NYT VR film, which was called The Displaced. Uh, this VR film, produced in collaboration with a production company called Verse, now called Within, uh, would take our readers to parts of the world most affected by a devastating refugee crisis. It was important that we demonstrated the importance of VR as a journalistic tool and that it could be a powerful way to engage with the most important stories of the day. Essentially, to legitimize the medium as a storytelling format to show it was not a gimmick and that it wasn't only about gaming. So I think all of us working in virtual reality at the time said some story of our first time that we really got it, you know, that we really felt the power of the medium. And so we were really pleasantly surprised when social media demonstrated that millions were now having similar experiences with our distribution of this medium and this film. And many have really told us since that uh, the New York Times, through this moment, really helped to create this surge of awareness about VR and move it from something people talked about at conferences to a household term. But um, you know, we've really always been looking forward. We know that this is the beginning still. The end of 2015, when we did this first cardboard distribution, already feels like a million years ago um, in this really fast-moving space. But we are still in the, re in the beginning of this. Um, we, we aren't really... We're not, we weren't really entirely sure what would happen next with VR at the times after this initial launch, but we continued to develop our in-house capability and continued to explore and experiment. Then news broke, an attack on a nightclub in Paris. So uh, two masthead editors asked if we could cover the aftermath in virtual reality. This was a question that I really had no good answer for at the time. Um, at the time of these attacks, our, our test rig was with, with a few members of our department for a test run in Rio. So we decided to send this to, to Paris. We sent a video producer and a, another journalist on a flight immediately over there, and we trained them over video chat, essentially, from our New York offices, how to load cameras into the rig, um, best practices, et cetera. And we started to do some reporting. Where were vigils emerging, the most expected locations for that to happen, but still our videographers on the ground had to find the best spots to place the camera and kind of learn this medium on the fly. So as more shots came in, we decided to expand the ambitions of the piece, um, despite what was a really tight breaking news deadline. So Vigils in Paris became our follow-up to The Displaced and was our first VR film that we did uh, entirely in-house production. So this was created at the tail end of 2015, and it's a virtual reality film that captures the city in mourning. Um, and it was an attempt to use this medium not um, in replace of other coverage that we would already do, but to try and use it for what it seemed to do best, um, which is to create this sense of presence there. Uh, we wanted to create something that connected you to the people of Paris and to this event in a more emotional um, and a more maybe empathetic way. Uh, a feeling of being there with them at at these vigils to feel the energy and the quietude of the traditions of mourning. So we all know that it's really awkward to try and show VR in this setting, but uh, I'll just show you a little bit of this um, from some screen capture. I had to come here to find peace, to deal with my feelings. I didn't bring flowers or candles, 
but I just felt the need to come pay respects to the victims. I was very affected by what happened. I couldn't focus on my studies, so I simply had to come. To be Muslim now is to prove that we have nothing to say. Even now I know our religion will be profaned. People who did it are not Muslim to me. They're terrorists. That's it. It's inhumane in my opinion. Their goal to terrorize people won't work as long as we keep our spirits up, remain lucid. I'll just skip ahead a little. So, you know, what I think is amazing about this new medium is that we have this really incredible opportunity to define what it is and what this can be as content creators. I don't think that's something that really happens that often. And as a journalist, there's also this other layer of, think layer of thinking about this as well. How do the rules, how do the ethics that we've applied in the past uh, essentially adapt to this new medium? You know, for example, you know, one interesting element of VR from a transparency perspective, I think, is a lack of a crop. There's still camera placement, but um, you know, when you choose a shot in a traditional video, you're essentially making editing decisions by what you include and exclude uh, from the frame. Um, and with VR, you give a lot of that back to the viewer because you capture everything. Uh, so in a traditional role, the journalist is behind the camera. They're making those subtle and important decisions involved with that framing. VR takes that away to some degree, or at least you know, maybe makes it different uh, in a way that we're still discovering. So now there is no behind the camera, but there's still the framing of that, where the camera's placed, uh, which is incredibly important. And I think as VR develops, we'll learn a bit, and we are learning a bit, how this compares to uh, the role as in more traditional camera work. My colleague Ben Solomon, who is one of the journalists who shot the Paris film, put it in a way that I like, which is to describe tr traditional filmmaking as hunting with a rifle versus VR, which is more like setting a bear trap. And you know, everyone talks about empathy. That's the buzzword around VR. The idea being that if you are virtually transported to a place, there's no longer that distance created by the frame. And as a result, viewers will gain this stronger emotional attachment to the characters, to the subject. I think this is a great, there is a great potential there, but this is really not guaranteed. I think it still depends on how well your shots are constructed, whether it's a compelling story being told, just like any other me medium we've worked in. Um, but I do find it intriguing that VR relies on a viewer's perception and discovery of content and not just the cuts and frames decided on by an editor. So another VR piece we produced soon after this uh, in 2016 was called The Contenders. In this piece, we try to give viewers a visceral sense of each of the campaigns of this election's front runners uh, by putting you in with the crowds as buses arrive at diners. Feels like ancient, ancient history now. In small diners, banquet halls, and sports arenas, the presidential candidates have staged events to stoke enthusiasm among their supporters or persuade the undecided. Over the months, the scale and tone of the candidates' appearances have more clearly shown us who they really are. Ted Cruz loves campaigning in rural towns, at restaurants and workplaces. People who turn out usually like him or support him already. Oh man, I should have wore my shirt. Yeah, I didn't think yeah. about that. You should have called me and told me to wear my shirt. I didn't know you had one. Oh yeah. Doesn't everybody in town have a shirt? He's got everything. He's got everything. 
Oh, you're not okay. Oh, you're Cruise events have a neighborly vibe. He sounds like he's confiding in you. His voice has emotional, breathless urgency. It can cast a spell. This is our time. If we stand together, we will win the Iowa caucuses. Mm -hmm. If we stand together, we will win the primaries, we will win the nomination. If we stand together, we will win the general election in November 2016. We will defeat Hillary Clinton. And we will turn this country around and bring back this exceptional nation that each and every one of us loves with all our hearts. Amen. And I have to show you some Trump rally because, you know. Let it begin tonight. Let it begin in this place. Let it begin now. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the name above all names. That guy's the worst clapper I've ever seen. I don't know. Yeah. So, so one of the things we learned from covering the U.S. election in VR was that virtual reality often requires really special access, different from what might work or what we're used to with traditional uh, journalism shooting. You normally. Uh, the access of a journalism outlet uh, would get at a political rally would be inside the press pit. But this doesn't really work at all for VR. Um, you don't want your viewer to feel like they're being surrounded by photographers. It's not the point. Um, not, you, know, you want them to be in the crowds, to feel that energy, to feel what it's really like to be there. So getting the right kind of access can require really special pre-planning. Um, in this case, I had to actually ask Donald Trump himself um, and kind of try to explain to him what a VR rig was. He was very interested in that. So, you know, because we needed to get the camera really close to the stage and into his security zone, essentially. So luckily he was open to that and we were able to get our camera right there so that you could be in the crowd watching the uh, Freedom Girls do their thing to understand a little better. So, you know, VR is a medium at the time that, at this time, that really wants control and setups. And doing this, things this way are, is really the exact opposite, so it's, it's tough. And, you know, we continue to experiment on how we're going to use this medium. So, uh, a few months later, we produced a project called Seeking Pluto's Frigid Heart, which is an experience that takes you three billion miles from the sun on a trip to Pluto. It's built entirely from photography and data that was captured by the New Horizons spacecraft. Um, so two years ago, this is what Pluto looked like to the world. Basically just a blur of a few pixels. And that all changed two summers ago when New Horizons flew by this planet. So this is an actual photo of Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. And as New Horizons flew by Pluto, it captured this incredible image of the planet backlit by the sun, which simultaneously revealed that the planet had an atmosphere and that it was uh, blue in hue. So in the VR piece, we could actually take you even closer than New Horizons itself. Through the data collected, we're actually able to place you down on the planet's surface at several spots. One spot is uh, above what's called Pluto's uh, Pale Heart. It's a location uh, that's been named the Al Idrisi Mountains. And so we worked with NASA and the Lunar and Planetary Institute on this project who helped us to create accurate extrapolations of what it would be like to stand at these locations. So this is an image, an early rendering of a place we bring you to and allow you to stand there and look around. Um, 
This is some of the terrain mapping that we were able to get through um, photogrammetry techniques that were ca of photos captured by New Horizons as it passed the planet. And we would take this, um, and this is an early camera test, uh, into 3D software and film it with our virtual VR camera. We also give you a really close look at New Horizons itself with this model that's accurate down to the screw. And we combine all of these models, this data, this photography, and virtually film it essentially to create the VR scenes. They're rendered out in high resolution, edited together. So here's sample, left eye over right eye. Uh, so in, in a headset, you know, the images are stereoscopic. Um, and one of the features of our apps is this ability to use positional audio. Um, and uh, this side of our apps was developed by a studio called Q Department in Manhattan. Um, and we wanted to do something with a soundtrack that would live up to the power of the imagery that we were able to create. I wanted the music to live in this positional audio world. So I wrote a, the Pluto Chorale, which is a four-part vocal chorale for soprano, mezzo, tenor, and bass. And we brought in four opera singers to perform and record it around a positional microphone, which would capture this sound at 360 degrees. This is at Dubway Studios. So now as you're viewing the VR and you look around, the voices swirl around you as well. And I think it really brings the music into this, the world of this new medium. And so we're also looking into how VR can use, be used to augment and present in new ways the Times' rich and extensive archive of material. So for the Rio Olympics, we created a VR experience that would transport you to historically momentous Olympic moments through history using the Times' extensive photo uh, archives as the foundation. So our, our, our approach to the Olympics and Olympics coverage in general has been from the perspective that the games uh, have the most meaning when they're considered in context, be it through the history of an event or the gradual improvement of athletes over time. Uh, for example, for London, we produced a series called All the Medalists, which used animated data visualizations to show how athletes have improved over time. Uh, for the 100 meter sprint, we showed where runners would end up on the track for every year going back to 1896 in relation to the race uh, day's resulting record. And for long jump, we compared results uh, over time to explain the stakes of the sport and how a record in 1968 still hadn't been broken, um, very different from the continual record breaking of other sports. So we were interested in how we could extend this approach using virtual reality and make it more about uh, experience and presence. We collaborated with uh, the production studio The Mill um, to make this a reality. So they put together a short video uh, that I think gives a good overview. I'll just show you um, that. The New York Times came to us with a number of different photographs from various Olympics over the last century. And they wanted to take a number of those particular moments and turn them into full 360 degree VR experiences. Initially, a lot of our thinking had to do with almost creating an art museum kind of experience because these are photos. Instead, we thought we'd go the extra step and try and take you there, right? So as a viewer, get you into perspectives that none of us ever get to see, you know, who don't compete in these games. There were four key scenes that we ended up going through. The first is 1896 in Athens. Then we go to 1932, which was the LA Olympics. We showcase Babe Dittrichson. Then we move ahead to the 1968 Olympics, where we track Bob Beeman's high jump. And finally, we end up in 2008 Beijing, and there you'll see Usain Bolt. We pinned up a whole bunch of photographs and we were constantly looking at the, the entire image from different angles and saying, how could this work as a photograph in this direction or this direction or this direction? It's the kind of circumstance where it's a perspective you never really are able to find yourself in. So we wanted to make it something that was really viscerally engaging and gave somebody a viewpoint that was unique and immersive. Using their extensive archives, we were able to pinpoint a specific hero photo that would drive the rest of the experience from that and basically just build a 3D version of that stadium. We used Massive for the crowds and it was trying to find photos in the times and then make like a very simple generic outfit that would have been appropriate at the time that the event was happening. 
On the 2D side of things, the biggest challenge was to control for the lighting. We had to figure out a way to make everything feel like it sat in the same scene with a common light source. At a certain point in 3D space, you don't have to put as much detail. But as we got the characters coming much closer to camera, those were basically built out in 3D. If you look at something like Bob Beeman's jump in the 68 Olympics in Mexico, that's a fully modeled figure that we've then used as image as a texture and mapped onto. The photographs themselves, they're images that are taken at a particular point in time. And of course, our photographic techniques have evolved. You're sort of watching not only the evolution of the event itself, but the evolution of the techniques of photography. And um, one of our most recent VR projects, and maybe our most ambitious yet, brings our readers on a journey below and above the ice in Antarctica. The project began with a call from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Research Department. They had seen our Pluto VR project and were curious if VR would be a good way to cover the research they were, would be doing in Antarctica. After we learned about their work and the various um, opportunities, we, we decided, yes, this would be a perfect opportunity for VR because it really checked uh, all the boxes. You could bring people to a place they wouldn't otherwise be able to go, cover an important story like climate change, and just have an opportunity to capture incredible, uh, unique imagery. The researchers would be primarily studying the Ross Ice Shelf, which is a Texas-sized floating piece of ice attached to the Antarctic continent facing towards New Zealand. And uh, this is some of the least understood bathymetry or ocean bottom topography in the world. So by mapping this, they could understand the potential risks to the ice shelf and its potential for collapse and contribution to rising sea levels. They would be flying a grid pattern over the ice shelf in C-130 military cargo planes with a slew of custom equipment to do this mapping. Uh, we were, of course, interested in the most interesting filming we could do uh, for this aspect of the project, and we determined that we could install a, a bubble window um, on the side of the aircraft. This was really great because it, it would give us this ability to create a VR experience where you felt like you were just outside of the plane, kind of looking over this incredible landscape. We had a lot to figure out. Um, how would we deal with the vibration of these planes? Uh, how would we mount a camera? What kind of camera would, we, would be appropriate for this? And we would need to figure this all out, you know, specking out our, our equipment needs before we went down there. Um, so we spent a lot of time forming solutions at a military base upstate where we would be able to test various solutions in the window. Um, arranging a project like this takes a number of steps. First, we needed to obtain a National Science Foundation grant this would give us the necessary support to get to the McMurdo military base on the continent from which we would launch all of our filming missions. Uh, we then needed to um, get PQ'd, which polar qualified, which means a lot of, a lot of blood tests, basically. Um, we flew with 13 cases of equipment from New York to Christchurch um, in coach, I should add. Uh, in Christchurch, we were outfitted with our Ant Antarctic gear, so you could wear a Canada Goose jacket, and it's not trendy, it's just what you do. Um, so this is the clothing distribution center where, where, uh, where all of this stuff is issued to you. Uh, it was also a chance to do last minute tests on our equipment, like, in, like this tetrahedral microphone that we would use for recording ambisonic sound um, when we were there. Uh, next day, we flew down to Antarctica in a South African-owned C-130 prop plane run by an Italian crew and retrofitted with commercial airplane seats. It was very comfortable. Um, this is an eight-hour flight where you're really constantly on edge because it's not uncommon to fly about seven hours of the trip and then do what's called a boomerang because there's really terrible weather forecasting in Antarctica. So you could get sent right back. Um, but luckily, um, we had good weather and we made it down. And uh, you step out on the continent and it's quite surreal. Um, you know, we would now be getting used to life on, on base. We'd, I'd be rooming with my colleagues freshman year dorm style, eating in the galley, and getting used to 24 hours of sun. Uh, no more night for two weeks. We actually arrived for Thanksgiving um, and they made me this really nice welcome placemat, I guess. Um, and our handler, Elaine, uh, who's an NSF employee, was tasked with you know, enabling our access to all the areas we would need to film and where we, we would eventually be able to bring our readers. 
Um, she's really excited here to be receiving an avocado, which is like gold in Antarctica. Um, so many of the locations we would visit, um, we had to go through really special training um, as a matter of safety. So how do you avoid frostbite? How do you set up a tent in an emergency? Um, I didn't think I'd really pull any of it off, so luckily there were no emergencies. Um, many great filming opportunities. We had under the ice with NSF divers, um, helicopter flights through um, the incredible dry valleys, um, remote penguin colonies um, on the edge of the sea ice. Everyone loves penguins. Um, the ice tectonics of the pressure ridges, um, and the C-130 flights with the researchers across the Ross ice shelf. Uh, and the pieces, you know, they really benefit from a wide range of elevations and perspectives. You know, we have below the ocean, we have on the ground, we have up to 100 feet above the ground from incredible vantage points, um, hundreds of feet from helicopters, thousands of feet from cargo planes. Um, and you could say hundreds of thousands of feet from a space perspective um, which we, uh, of the continent where we present um, data that we collected and renderings of Antarctica at Earth scale. Four, in the end, we have four virtual reality experiences were, were created from, from what we gathered. One is a virtual reality helicopter tour through the dry valleys, which is the driest place on Earth. Um, in this piece, which is called 36 Juliet, uh, you fly along the edge of the East Antarctic ice sheet, you visit the saltiest body of water in the world, and you stand on a scenic overlook where only a handful of humans um, have set foot before. Um, I was told that I was the first person to ever stand somewhere, and then my colleague told me that he had just stood there, so I was kind of disappointed, but otherwise, yeah. Um, so yeah, these valleys are the closest equivalent our planet has to the landscape of Mars. and shooting VR, we are always having a problem to solve, basically. So the big problem we had in Antarctica, um, even inside the helicopter, was the cameras um, and the cold. So we, had, we basically had one chance ever to get these shots, and of course our cameras were dying every few seconds. So sometimes you have to improvise, um, you have to get creative and use whatever was available. So this was one of the cameras just stuffed with all the hand warmers that we had. And, it worked, and there's a film. Uh, so another piece that we have in the series is called McMurdo Station, and it, it brings you to the United States Antarctica Research Outpost, and we answer the question, what does it take to keep a 1,000 people alive, housed, supplied, and fed in the least um, habitable continent, thousands of miles from civilization? Uh, you know, few people will, will ever visit McMurdo. Um, but with virtual reality, we can lead viewers on a tour through this really fascinating part of the world. And McMurdo's, McMurdo's been described as like a mining camp across to the college campus, part science laboratory, um, you know, a place where sleds and tents designed 100 years ago by the first Antarctic explorers are still um, used alongside massive high-tech vehicles. There is no hardware store down the street. There is no fuel station down the street. We have to provide all of that for this research at the bottom of the world. So 
So, you know, the imagery that we, we can capture rarely comes out in a form that will be acceptable from the start. VR has a ton of post-production needs uh, and requirements that are really specific to the medium. Um, for example, fixing really harsh shadows cast by the equipment, that really takes you out of the scene. Um, and very hard to avoid since there's no behind the camera. Um, so on the right, you can see the, the final shot, which is a lot better. Um, but it's really hard to do this kind of work in, in stereoscopic, which is very unforgiving. Uh, another, another of the pieces that we produce is called A Shifting Continent, and this is the one that focuses directly on the research that uh, Columbia was doing. Um, you know, Antarctica is this inhospitable desert of ice, shifting in slow motion over hundreds and thousands of years. So with virtual reality, we can highlight the beauty of the continent and really show the movement of these massive ice sheets that can hold enough water to actually raise sea levels by 60 meters. Um, so you'll stand among penguins and seals uh, who live on the ice. You ride with the scientists in military aircraft um, as they fly over the shelf um, using a suite of instruments to study uh, this least understood continent. going out there to try and understand the planet. In, uh, in this one, we had the opportunity to take advantage of the strong data visualization skills on our graphics desk and create imagery like this, which um, is not playing, but that's okay. Um, let me try that again. Let's see. Well, imagine it moving. Um, where we could show the movement of the ice across uh, the continent based on um, velocity and direction of flow in order, there we go, in order to better explain the, con the creation of and, um, and the risks involved with these ice shelves. And this element was developed um, for, for part of the VR experience where uh, you're actually approaching the continent from the space perspective for the first time. But we were able to take that same work and also use it to develop this really incredible two-page spread print piece, as well as um, an interactive for desktop and mobile. So this flow is another thing we're really thinking about a lot. From VR back to our core platforms and our other storytelling platforms. Um, and we really see Antarctica as kind of a model for how we can create, you know, improve this relationship between VR and everything else and create these efficiencies as we bring VR closer into um, our core report. So lastly, um, in Under a Cracked Sky, we take you on a journey with science support divers below the frozen ocean. So under eight feet of Antarctic sea ice lies the clearest water on Earth. You can plunge through a small hole um, in the ice to dive with seals, explore ice caves, glide past lactites of frozen seawater, and swim over um, a rocky black seabed crawling with life. The film was um, narrated and photographed by two research divers at McMurdo Station um, who have more experience diving under the ice than, than anyone else on the planet. Oh. 
so Under a Cracked Sky, uh, it's been featured in film festivals around the world, and it's hosted right here at SIGGRAPH in the VR theater. So if you have time, I encourage you to check it out. Um, you know, the biggest challenge with this piece was training the divers and the best practices of VR filmmaking to make sure that we would actually get a usable result, uh, specking out equipment uh, that would work for underwater VR filming, and, and also coming up with some solutions to make sure that the project would feel good in a headset. You know, we didn't want to feel like you were being carried around by a diver, um, or feel like the diver was a huge presence in the frame. Um, so sometimes just simple things like um, sending down, you know, really long poles for them to shoot with, um, which would push them back in the frame. Um, this worked a lot better than expected, you know. So in a shot like this, uh, it isn't really apparent right away who's filming sometimes. It's that guy. Um, so um, time-wise, we're getting, we've got to wrap it up. Okay. So let's see. Um, let me just, I've got just like one more minute. What should we get? Okay. Yeah, so this is the two year anniversary of this. Um, we've been able to do a very wide range of projects in these apps. Um, we've seen a lot of really good traction for them. Um, we've launched on other platforms like Daydream, we've launched the Daily 360, and. Um, We were trying other modes of, and uh, technologies, like we just did a shoot this weekend with Lytro, um, doing some light field capture. And this Thursday, we'll be launching NYT VR on Gear VR. So this is just, you know, it's the biggest VR platform in the marketplace right now, really. So we're really excited to have Times VR content there and reach millions of people at high quality. So I'm going to leave it there, and thank you guys so much. Our next speaker is Ed Wu. Ed is the Director of Software Engineering at Niatic. He leads the engineering team of Pokemon Go and manages Niatic's technology platform. Before joining them in 2011, while it was still an autonomous unit within Google, he worked as a launch engineer on their first game, Ingest. He received his PhD in physics from Stanford. Hi, I'm Ed Wu. Um, I'm uh, extremely honored to be here um, at, as a former academic. Uh, uh, I know that this, is, this presentation was meant to inspire you, and hopefully um, some of the lessons that we learned uh, throughout the, the launch of Pokemon Go um, will inspire some of the, the cutting edge research that many of you are presenting here today. So uh, just to go into some background, um, 
Niantic uh, was an uh, autonomous unit inside Google before it became an in independent startup. And uh, its roots go back to uh, its founder, um, uh, John Henke, our CEO, as well as our CTO, Phil Kesslin, who actually uh, created uh, uh, a program called EarthViewer uh, at a startup called Keyhole that was acquired by Google and became Google Earth. So for a very long time, for decades, we've actually, our, our, our founders have actually been um, working with the merger and, uh, of both um, geospatial information and the real world. And um, the reason that they started up in the Antic in the first place inside Google as a, as, a, as a kind of internal startup was because at that point in time, um, mobile phones were becoming um, more and more widespread. Uh, and uh, the experiences for them were confined to things like news and email. And so they'd go to places like the beach or the park and they'd see families you know, running around together, the, the, the children having a good time, and the parents like staring at their mobile phones, um, looking at, at these apps instead of like experiencing the world around them uh, with their children uh, and uh, 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 you know, kind of ignoring the beautiful scene around them. So John and Phil asked themselves, you know, can we invert that relationship? Can we actually make uh, technology um, bring us closer to the real world, bring us closer to the, the people in our lives. Uh, and so that's what, we're, what, that's what we're trying to do with all of our products at their heart. We try to obey this mantra of uh, adventures on foot with others. And so let's see if this works this way. Um, so um, uh, 10 months after our spin up, we launched Pokemon Go. And, and, and this is Thousands of people actually self-organizing to play our game a week after that on the streets of San Francisco. And all communally launching to the game to the idea that Pokemon are out there and that they're together. And meanwhile, inside Niantic itself, um, this is what was happening. So, uh, we were res responsible. We, we went and looked at, you know, what previous, you know, Top end mobile products had done in terms of you know first month of daily uh, daily users for well known IPs and we set a launch target that was consistent uh, for our, for the underlying transactions in our cloud data store um, that was that was consistent with that, that market research and then we multiplied that by, by five times because like that would be a ludicrous number there's no way that we'd hit that and then of course within a few hours of launch we were well on, trending on, well on our way to our, the ludicrous number and um, eventually hit 50 times. Uh, what we originally expected, um, which is a reflection of the fact that Pokemon Go was this um, cultural phenomenon that was really being embraced everywhere around the world um, uh, uh, simultaneously. And so, um, sorry. The impact of Pokemon Go has been enormous. Um, it's been downloaded over 750 million times, uh, and uh, kind of even more pertinent to our mission, uh, we've inspired our players to, to catch, and this is just through the end of last year, I'm sorry that I haven't had time to recompute the, st the st statistics, but, um, but just through the end of last year, our players have collectively walked um, more than, uh, than 8.7 billion kilometers and, and caught 88 billion Pokemon. Um, so the scale of this, this, this mobile app is, is enormous. Um, but I think, um, uh, at this point, it's, it's good to, ref to reflect on kind of the media coverage and, and why you're all here. Uh, because Pokemon Go's conversation at launch was really about the, um, uh, in many ways, was about this augmented reality experience, about um, uh, this uh, camera feed that we had piped into the Pokemon encounter scene um, and stabilized with a gyro to place a Pokemon uh, into, the, uh, into the real world and give you um, uh, uh, the, the conceit of, of actually catching a Pokemon that existed in the real world. And this was a fairly um, limited application of, of, of augmented reality, right? There's no occlusion, there's no tracking here, right? Um, it's, it's simply using the, the phone's gyro and camera feed. And nonetheless, conversations about AR took off, um, and uh, Pokemon Go was widely cited as the first mass market um, uh, AR application. And more to the point, um, people really believed in this idea of Pokemon in the real world to the point that they were um, taking and, and t uh, pictures uh, uh, posed by um, Pokemon in the, in the scenes and inserting themselves into the scenes. And I'm sure you've seen Pokemon uh, pictures shared with Pokemon in all manner of places. Uh, uh, 
uh, shared by millions of people uh, on social media and, and, and back and forth to their friends. I think this was a real indication that despite the fact that there was no underlying hardware technology to, for example, um, contextually recognize that, there, that there's somebody's hands there and that you could place a Pokemon in them, the users were self-positioning the Pokemon uh, within the scenes to create that story for themselves. Um, and so this was rather fortuitous because at the same time, uh, augmented reality hardware um, was kind of at the center of the conversation, right? We were at Google, so we um, had knowledge of, of uh, Project Tango and the, and the way that was developing. And likewise, um, uh, you know, a lot of conversations, both now and, and um, last year, were, were uh, uh, talking about augmented reality, were talking about the immersive hardware experiences that are uh, being pioneered by, by folks um, such as those creating uh, HoloLens. Um, but our CEO, John Hankey, has always made the argument that uh, a, uh, AR is actually um, uh, here today in a, in a certain fashion on every mobile phone. And if you think about the, the mobile, nav uh, mobile map navigation experience, um, ultimately, that is a fusion of geospatial data with where you are, with um, uh, virtual cues that actually modifies and changes your behavior, right? This is um, why, if you want to take a step back, let's actually it, um, you know, t take a step back from the hardware uh, you know, level uh, abstractions that we, we talk about, about occlusion and tracking and localization and so on, and think, if we had a product that actually performed perfectly, um, you know, in, in the real world, merged the real and virtual world, treated the real world as non-homogenous and actually allowed people to um, uh, move from place to place and have um, really interesting um, augmented reality experiences, how would users behave? Well, one of the first things that, um, that I, 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 we posit that they would do is that they would organize meetups. You see meetups in the virtual world. We've, many of us have done uh, 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 encounters in, in multiplayer uh, games where we meet up in a virtual location and likewise, uh, uh, pro you know, after SIGGRAPH, we might meet up, meet up for, uh, for drinks um, uh, at a bar, right? Um, likewise, we would see uh, users desiring to share that experience and, and the visuals of that experience with others. A augmented reality application that was was perfect in the future, right? We would expect people to want uh, to that it was so compelling that they would want to draw people others into that world, and their movement and behavior would be shaped by those virtual cues. And um, I posit that a lot of this actually happened in Pokemon Go. If you look at um, the launch, uh, launch and subsequent um, success of Pokemon Go as an augmented reality pr product, and so. I think it's, it's important to recognize that Pokemon Go was successful as an augmented, re mass market augmented reality application and, and perceived as such, not because of our relatively limited um, technological implementation of, of, the, the, of, of augmented reality. It was perceived as an augmented reality success because people believed that Pokemon might actually exist. So how did we do that? Um, so it's good to go back to our roots uh, 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 within Google and the first game that we produced, Ingress. So Ingress is more of an alternate reality game. Um, the conceit here is that your phone is actually a view onto uh, a different world, uh, alternate dimension of our world, um, onto which uh, uh, there are two factions, the Resistance and Enlightened um, in green and blue, um, uh, uh, contending to, to take over that alternate reality. And Initially, um, the places on the, on, in that virtual game that we populated in the very, very earliest experiments were procedurally generated. And that did not work at all. Because what happened was you'd be standing at, you know, in the middle of some um, field off 10 meters off some, some random street corner, and the game would be telling you this is an incredibly important location in the game because we procedurally populated that way. And yet, um, you'd be looking around and there was like nothing meaningful, right? It produced this element of cognitive dissonance uh, a term we'll return to um, that really drew the user out of the game. So one of the major problems that we solved with, for, for Ingress was we initially seeded it with a, a data set of one million really interesting, notable real world locations, and then had our users contribute more and more data to, uh, 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 to us to uh, expand that data set to over six million um, what we call portals. And a second 
really important element of Ingress is that virtually everything that you see on that left-hand um, screen is modifiable by the user. Um, if they you know, collect enough energy, if they walk around, if they move around enough, they can um, change those elements that from green to blue or blue to green for their team. They can destroy links, they can recreate links, they can, um, they can harvest what we call uh, XM, those energy glo globules on the ground. And not only that, they can modify that and everybody within a one or two kilometer radius of them sees that state change in near real time, right? It is a single modifiable, uh, modifiable world that is consistent for everybody who plays the game. So when we go back to what kind of effects would we expect from a, a very successful augmented reality product, we would, um, uh, we, we would imagine that that product would shape the way that people actually live their, their lives. But, you know, it's extremely, we're creatures of habits in many ways, and it's actually quite difficult for us to, to modify our, our patterns of behavior. And yet, our English players were self-reporting that, um, that they were going way out of their way to play Ingress every day. And we were seeing this in, in, in our data. Um, and because Ingress was, uh, uh, it was and is a highly social game where you have to cooperate with um, many, many other individuals to, uh, to create changes on, on that game board, um, uh, communities began to form around Ingress. And then friendships began to, began to form around Ingress, and then marriages, and then babies uh, began to form around Ingress. And on top of that, um, Users were self-reporting um, to us through social media posts uh, like these here, as well as through market research surveys, that they were actually uh, uh, getting health benefits out of playing Ingress because they were actually getting out and about and walking more. And so what we learned from Ingress inside Google um, was that AR games can really change the real-world behavior of users in, in positive ways and promote meaningful so social interactions. But in order to have those social interactions, you need a game that is inherently social and that lives on the single coherent world. Finally, it can ex encourage exploration and discovery, both locally and, and far beyond, but you need the right data for the incentives to go to great locations. So we took all of that and began to think about what we wanted to do for Pokemon Go. And this is one of the very first pieces of, of concept art by, um, by uh, one of our designers, Krzysztofski, where um, you can see that we wanted to have a deeper um, combination of the real and virtual worlds than we did in Ingress. Um, we wanted to actually embed Pokemon into, into the real world in, in, in some fashion. And so it's at this point that I think it's really important to talk about cognitive dissonance, because the, one of the major lessons that we learned from, uh, from Ingress was that um, you need to avoid this at all costs if you want to, to have people maintain the suspension of disbelief that they're actually um, operating in this and playing in this, in this virtual world. So what is cognitive dissonance? It's when what your mind sees on the screen differs from the reality that you're experiencing around you. So um, one, one way that might happen is if, you're, you know, if your screen is showing some you know, beautiful snowy mountain, that you're in, uh, uh, but you look around and you're on some beach somewhere, right? Another way is if as cited before, you go to this incredibly notable location in the game, and it's just completely bland. Um, it has no, it, there, there's nothing that signifies that this is an actual notable, no, notable location in the real world. Another way that cognitive distance can occur is if the people around you are playing um, the same game as you, um, but they experience something different, right? If they're reacting to something truly exciting on their screen, and you have no um, conception, uh, and you're standing in the exact same place, um, and you're not having the same experience, that social cue also provides an element of cognitive dissonance. And so we made conscious design and product and engineering choices to avoid this. Um, and so I, I think it's important to, uh, I, I think it's useful to go through a few examples of how we got to where we are. So prior to um, doing the camera feed uh, uh, based AR, our initial thought was to use server-side data, uh, provided um, photosphere data collected by um, en masse um, uh, 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 by cars traveling with um, 360 degree cameras to pull in um, uh, Pokemon and then place them onto a scene inside the game. Um, but this didn't really work um, because given the field of view of the, the, um, of the, the photospheres, um, 
either you had to put, um, if you tried to put the Pikachu in the scene at life scale, uh, or at the scale of what a Pikachu is supposed to be, it becomes unplayably small. But um, uh, if you try to inflate it so that it's playable, then you get this like massive Pikachu that's like way bigger than the humans in this scene. This is even more distracting if you're using server-side provided photosphere data because uh, that's taken at some other time and place, and those humans aren't actually in the scene at the same time, right? Um, so, I think, so this is our very first um, AR prototype. Uh, uh, and this is one of, one of the backyard of one of our designers, David Holland, where you will see that this actually turns out to be quite close to the final experience. This is actually the very first time that we, 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 we tried to pipe, pipe this in. And this actually turns out to be quite close to the final experience that we see. And then that simply piping the camera feed and using uh, the gyro to stabilize the scene um, actually uh, provided a much more natural experience than trying to embed the Pokemon into server-side photosphere data um, would provide. Um, this is our first office in, in uh, uh, near Seattle, and um, now we're trying to, uh, now Dave Holland is, is um, demonstrating for us the, the, the initial battle prototype and you can see that there's a massive sleight of hand going on here, right? There is no like surface mapping or tracking um, that is placing the Pokemon on the floor. Um, the, the camera operator, uh, the, the phone operator is, is, is kneeling very close to the floor to provide a, a scene element that you know, gives you the right perspective um, with the right scale that you would expect. And this anticipated um, the way that our users would actually uh, work with the game, right? They would go to the lengths of, um, of positioning uh, the Pokemon in the, in the scenes properly, um, even though the hardware did not support that automatically. So with the embedding of Pokemon into you know, an element of the real world somewhat solved, um, the design team uh, also was looking at the same time at how do you avoid cognitive dissonance in the presentation of your data, right? Um, the map for a, game, uh, for a game like Pokemon Go has to serve two purposes. It has to both serve that, um, the central conceit that you actually belong, uh, you are operating in this fantastical universe, um, but it also has to function as a game and present useful data to you. And so initially, the design team um, pushed closer towards the latter, and um, they created you know, an uh, increasingly abstract um, uh, uh, concept that actually didn't work all that well well, it felt cold and ab um, with respect to the underlying um, uh, Pokemon intellectual property. And so instead, um, they then tried to draw that back and make it even more naturalistic. But that too became problematic because um, if you're standing at the, the corner of Pico and Lincoln and all you see is like Lincoln Boulevard and a few palm trees um, around you, there's again an element of cognitive dissonance if what your, your game map is showing you is a bunch of beautiful bushes and shrubbery. And so what we eventually came to was something that um, was somewhat abstract, but still um, had the green lush feel of, of, po of the Pokemon IP so that it did not break the, the, um, the, that suspension of disbelief in either direction. And so the final element um, uh, that, uh, that uh, helped uh, you know, prevent cognitive dissonance was this single shared consistent world that I've talked about previously with, with Ingress, except now we had to create a technology that could scale to potentially hundreds of thousands of people seeing one Pokestop get lured or one gym get changed in the middle of central Tokyo. Now, you can imagine the technological challenge necessary to, to address this, this, right? No single home SQL server is going to, to scale to that, to that kind of extent. But um, when one user changes the map, everybody within a one or two kilometer radius, no matter how many people are playing the game, need to consistently see the same thing being changed. Otherwise, we break the conceit of a single shared world. And um, we go to this, all this trouble just to, sh to make it so that you know, a Squirtle can show up in the same place um, for everybody who happens to be next to that Squirtle, right? So, so, so if I see a Squirtle, if somebody walks up next to me, um, she'll see a Squirtle, and if somebody walks up next to, next to her, she'll, she'll see a Squirtle as well. Why does all this matter? Because if we had not done this, we would not get 500 plus people um, yelling Squirtle on one end of Bellevue Park and all running in the same direction to, to go to go to go capture it. 
Um, and so I think Pokemon Go ended up um, um, having surprising benefits because the social interaction um, filled in the gaps in, uh, in people's uh, minds um, of, you know, from our relatively limited, uh, uh, you know, AR, experience, uh, uh, AR camera experience to, you know, a relatively abstract map, to actually have people believe Pokemon were there in the real world because everybody else around them was acting similarly. And so you would get stories like this where people talked about how Pokemon Go helped with their social anxiety or their marriage or their autism. And so, to sum up, these are some of the lessons that we learned, um, which um, I, I hope will be of use um, to folks as they create even more immersive hardware experiences that um, you still have to avoid cognitive dissonance in your visual design and your data, and that the real world, the world that you know, we're all used to, um, thanks to the poly exclusion principle, you can't have two things in the same place. And we, um, if I move this lectern you know, a meter to the right, you all see that lectern move one meter to the right, and you can come up and touch that uh, lectern that's moved one meter to the right. It's a single, consistent, shared, mutable world. And the virtual world has to obey the same characteristics. And if you do that, and, then, and you give the people the ability to share that experience um, and the visuals with others, then um, I think the, the, then the experience will virally spread. And so um, just a few brief Games. notes on what's Pokemon next. Pokemon Go, um, a game, an app that you've probably already heard of. Even though our, our initial implementation was relatively Pokemon limited by the, the hardware available, level. we are now working uh, by being uh, able to off anchor with, uh, your virtual uh, content WWDC in the real world and really allow for get more immersive tracking experience. And I think experience it shows um, that we have a commitment but it doesn't to, stop there. As, there are a multitude of ways that you can use augmented reality to enhance your user experience. So let's see what goes into that. We'll continue to put in um, more immersive elements onto the map. Um, this is a prototype of you know, putting time, day, and weather into the map itself to continue to bring the game experience closer to reality. And um, we'll continue to create product uh, experiences that try to draw people together in the real world um, uh, on foot and explore like our Raves experience uh, um, has in the past few weeks. And so with that, um, we're hiring. So if you're a student and you're really excited about any of these things, please join, and thank you very, very much. Our final presentation is by Kent Bly. Since May of 2014, Kent has traveled to the top VR gatherings around the world and conducted over 750 Voices of VR podcast interviews, featuring the pioneering game developers, enthusiasts, and technologists driving resurgence of virtual reality. He combines his background in art and sciences to distill the diverse thoughts and impressions of leading immersive technology visionaries, creators, and academics, and provides a holistic look at the future of VR, told by the people who are making it. All right, so uh, yeah, like uh, my name's Kent Bai. I do the Voices of VR podcast, and I'm going to be talking today about how VR changes our sense of ourself as well as our, our sense of reality. Uh, now that I've uh, gone through and done over 750 interviews, I feel like I have like this 60,000 foot view, and I start to see these different uh, themes in that are emerging from talking to all these different people within the field of virtual reality. And so I've asked over 700 people now, what is the ultimate potential of virtual reality? And their answer tends to be into one of these major domains of human experience. Uh, you see a lot of things in entertainment, obviously, education, uh, career, uh, friends and family, higher education, travel, spirituality. If I were to start to categorize the different domains, these are the things that I'm seeing. Uh, 
And there's also this just sense of awe and wonder that people have, that they have their senses completely hacked, and then at the end of that experience, they're like, okay, well, you know, it's almost like you're, you're choosing to figure out like which pill you're taking, and you have this just deeper question of like, what is reality? And so uh, I'm gonna be talking today a little bit about some of the philosophical implications, uh, but also uh, like of how we view reality, but that, and at the end of the day, it's a reflection into ourselves. The more we learn about virtual reality, the more we learn about the nature of human experience. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about the philosophical implications of VR, uh, talk a little bit about the experiential age that I see that we're moving into, and then finally wrap up with uh, talking about my elemental theory of presence. So first, let's talk about the philosophical implications of VR. Now, when you talk to philosophers, a lot of these things have been talked about for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's just the thing that's different now is that people are having a direct experience within virtual reality, such that they're make, making uh, different challenges to their own metaphysical assumptions. This is a model that I've been finding really, really useful. It's Simon Wardley's model of technological, uh, technology evolution. And there's four basic stages. There's an idea that comes up. There's a genesis that's first being born. And that's like mostly when you have an academic idea. With a lot of stuff that you see here at SIGGRAPH is that genesis of an idea coming together. And then it, at some point, it gets into custom built bespoke systems. That's if you want to start to apply that into, into, into industry in some ways. And then after that point, you get into the mass consumer law of the technology, and then you get to the uh, mass ubiquity, and it, it's just a commodity. Right now, VR has been launched with the uh, consumer product, but still, at the same time, we still have a lot of bespoke systems. The philosophers, the one, they're the ones who are come up with those ideas, uh, and, I, and I think some of these metaphysical ideas have been out there for hundreds of years. It's just now it's starting to go into a mass consumer scale. So David Chalmers is a philosopher, and he has like these basic questions. Uh, are virtual objects real or fictional? Do virtual events really happen or not? Are virtual experience non-illusionary or illusionary? And are experiences in VR as valuable or not as valuable as experiences outside of it? And I think the interesting thing about these questions is that based upon your metaphysical assumptions about what reality is, you're gonna get different answers. So let's go to, uh, when, I, when I looked at the different ontologies uh, that are out there, you have this split, and I'll be breaking down these uh, into more detail, but this is split between dualism and monism. Cartesian dualism is this mind-body split, that's just that we have our physical body and our mind is something that's separate and different into this other realm. And in terms of experiential design, it's actually still very useful to separate the subject and the object and the content of an experience. When you're making experience, you still have to kind of separate those things. You have the object objective reality of the experience that you're creating, you have the subject and they're coming with their own experiences, and then you have the content that you're giving to people. Now, but when it comes to more metaphysical assumptions, you start to see this breakdown of that Cartesian split. You have mind-body interactions, you have your mind being able to impact your body, you have your belief systems to be able to affect your body. So there's a lot more fluidity about that Cartesian duality. And so you start to look into the other systems, like in monism. You have physicalism, idealism, and, and neutral monism. The physicalism is that, ba that's basically what most people in the mainstream have. That's like that matter is, the, the essence uh, and that everything is physical and that the mental processes is emergent from that. Idealism is that the, everything's coming from the mind and everything's emergent from that. And then neutral uh, monism is that there's some other third substance that could be something like consciousness. So let's just go through the, the, the mind-body dualism. There's a split between the uh, science and spirit. I think this is something that we've been living with for the last 500 years and we're just seeing that as you go through virtual reality, you start to see how those splits don't necessarily make sense as much anymore. Um, but materialism, you see this sort of foundation of, you have this foundation of physics, then chemistry, biology, psychology, and then at some point, consciousness is maybe emergent from that. We don't know. That's like uh, the hard problem of consciousness is to figure out the correlation between our neurology and that level of consciousness. But right now, that's an anomaly that um, the, the physicalists and the materialists can't yet describe, and anybody that has a, a virtual reality experience will have this phenomenology of direct experience that can't be described in these materialistic terms. So it starts to make you challenge whether or not this is a model that's gonna be adequate to be able to describe. And maybe we'll eventually uh, get there. I think that that's a possibility. But the, the downside to materialism is that um, the, it, if you go to the logic extreme of that, there's some people that just believe that we live in a deterministic world where you have no free will 
because there's no way to actually incorporate that at all within their framework. Now, uh, so from these two metaphysical assumptions, you, you basically come to the conclusion that uh, virtual objects are fictional, that the virtual events don't actually happen and that they're illusionary and they're not as valuable as real experiences. But anybody who's had uh, experiences within virtual reality, I think will say, well, actually I've had a direct experience where I feel like um, my experiences in VR are just as real. So then you start to have to go into a little bit other uh, ideas like idealism, where you start to have this combination of the, the science and the spirit. Um, also, the, there's this idea that consciousness may be fundamental. There may be some sort of fabric that's underlying before you get into the physical realm. And that this, instead of being an emergent property, it could be a fundamental property that goes beyond space-time. And I think that a lot of the studies within quantum entanglement are showing that there's faster than light, sp spooky action at a distance phenomena that are showing that there's something in this non-local field. Maybe consciousness is a part of that as well. Uh, so in that metaphysical assumption, you start to, to get into the more phenomenological ideas there that these are actually real. The other, another idea is that the consciousness is universal, such that you know, maybe that consciousness is embedded into every single dimension of our the fabric of, rea of our reality, down to the, each individual photon having the ability to make decisions. And this is like more of a panpsychic idea, and it's like really radical, but um, I think there's some uh, people that are out there uh, that are looking at these ideas of panpsychism, and it goes all the way back to other pre-modern ideas like uh, Neoplatonism as well could be considered a form of, of that as well. But this is a graphic from uh, Rick Tarnas looking at these different ideas. You know, on the primal worldview is that there is this consciousness that is embedded into the world. Um, but the modern worldview is that we are the only thing that is conscious. So again, Neoplatonism uh, have this concept of the anima mundi, the world soul, that there's something that is perhaps uh, uh, something that is that level of consciousness or organization at a higher level. And I think if you go back to even the Pythagoreanism, you have this mathematical reality could be a base reality. And to me, that's the interesting thing about this is that you start to have like modern physicists who are talking about like our mathematical universe, that maybe base reality is some sort of symbolic mathematical reality and that maybe there's something after that, but everything's emerging from that. So you're going back to these ancient ideas of Pythagorean ideas and then saying, well, you know, maybe there's this fabric of reality that's a symbolic reality, which then you get to this big discussion about, well, are we living in a computer simulation? Are we living in a simulated universe? So these are the types of questions that I think start to start to come up in the conversation. Uh, people starting to like start to believe that we may actually be living in a simulation. And if you do believe we live, live in a simulation, then any one of these uh, philosophical metaphysical assumptions could be correct. So in some ways, uh, virtual reality is providing like a reality Turing test. You have an experience in, in VR and then it, you come out of it and then you start to question your own ideas of what reality is and how you start to uh, change your relationship to it. And that's the thing that I, I see is that's the, these, these deeper questions. When I talk to philosophers, they're saying that, you know, they've had more interesting conversations about philosophy in the last two years after VR has come out than they have in the, like the last 10 or 15 years. It's something that uh, we're starting to think more deeply about. So uh, just want to move to uh, some of the other ideas that I've been exploring on the Voices of VR podcast. Uh, one is that we're moving from the information age into the experiential age. And so what does that mean? Well, we're moving from delivering intangible and customized services that are on demand to staging memorable and personal experiences that are revealed over a duration of time. And this is from Pine and Gilmore's Welcome to the Experience Economy back in 1998. They were starting to talk about that. But I see that uh, with the printing press, we have uh, the ability to capture information and knowledge that were stored in books in a new way back at 500 years ago. And that uh, with the computer, the computer is like the modern era of that printing press. You have the computer, you have video games, the internet, World Wide Web, mobile phones, uh, mobile gaming, as well as uh, the augmented and virtual reality technologies. All of these things are these experiential technologies that are allowing us to interact with media in a new way. And this has been unfolding over the last 100 years or so, but it's really starting to accelerate now with, with all these immersive technologies. And so we're kind of having a, whereas the text used to be really biased towards the left brain, objective, quantitative, 
we're having a lot of more of these right brain subjective qualitative types of technologies. And I would throw artificial intelligence in there as well, as that's as something that you have to train through giving it an, a, an experience. So these are just some uh, high level characteristics that I see within the uh, moving from the information age to the experiential age. Um, and here's uh, some more as well. But uh, overall, it's like something that used to be very linear is now more linear, uh, nonlinear and interactive. So finally, I just wanted to wrap up uh, talking a little bit about my uh, elemental theory of presence within virtual reality. Uh, this is something that um, came about because I was uh, first came uh, to Mel Slater's conceptualization of, of presence in virtual reality, how, do you, how does he describe it? And he describes it as the place illusion and the plausibility illusion. Am I here and is this real? And those are the two major questions that he was asking. But yet, as I was having all these different experiences, over a thousand now over the last three years, and talking to hundreds of different people, I found that there was more nu nuances and that the major presence theories in academia don't really necessarily account for the content. Uh, and this is from a, a survey that Dustin Chertoff did. So I came up with the, the four elements, the air element being the social mental presence, the water element being emotional presence, fire element being the active presence, and the, the earth element being embodied presence. And that it's a little bit more holistic way of thinking about all of these dimensions of presence are happening at the same time, but there's different trade-offs that you have between these, and that as a experiential designer, you have to figure out what mixture of these different dimensions of presence you're gonna have within your virtual reality experience in order to give someone an experience. And so, and gaming focuses a lot about agency and active and, and expressing your will within an experience as well as making choices and stimulating your mind in, in some way. Whereas the film is a lot more about emotional presence. It's about you know, giving you a story and a narrative that is trying to take you on a journey through character and story and uh, also just music as well. And then the thing that's new about virtual reality is it's giving you this sense of embodied presence. You're putting your body in the experience for the first time. You're hacking all of your sense, senses and you're giving this sense that you're actually there and you may have a, a virtual body representation, you have an avatar and identity within the experience and all these are new things that are, are new and unique to virtual reality. And so with that body, there's this, you know, if you look at, you know, there's about 10% of our, our mind that's being, our, our awareness that's being processed with our conscious mind and about 90% that's just below our level of, of conscious awareness and so, there's a lot of implications for what we're able to start to do now that we have someone's complete body within a VR experience, you're able to start to activate these things in different ways. And this is just a model saying from a very high level abstraction, you have the text and verbal symbols, but the, the further you go down closer to direct experience, the more rich of that experience it is. And I think that's, the, what's, that's not what we now have this available uh, to be able to do this with virtual reality technologies. There's this idea of embodied cognition, which is just that um, we don't just think with our minds, we think with our entire bodies, and that we also use our environment to be able to process and make sense of information. And so uh, it's just a more holistic way of thinking about uh, embodied cognition, and there's just a lot of huge implications for, for learning. And so these are the, the different, you know, the, the as I do interviews and have different experiences, this is just a framework that I found that just to be super helpful, and um, I'll just go through, uh, I've talked about this at Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference, you can see more specific information, but I just wanted to, to end uh, talking a little bit about, you know, how virtual reality is changing our sense of ourselves. You know, there's this sense of awe and wonder that we're able to invoke within virtual reality, and because of that, we're able to explore uh, and expand our category schemas. We're able to see things that are too vast for us to have a, a direct experience of in our ordinary lives. And there's a transform, right now there's like, we're moving from the information age to the experiential age, but I think the next step after just the uh, raw experience that we're having people, people are gonna have a lot more appreciation to transformative experiences. And what does that mean to have a transformative experience within virtual reality? And I just got back from the uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences conference where I was doing interviews with these consciousness researchers who have been studying this for 10 years. And they came up with their, their own model of, of consciousness transformation, which is that you have these different experiences, you uh, 
then there's anomalies that are that don't fit within your experience but because you're having a direct experience it almost forces you to expand your worldview and that the more that we do that iteration uh, the more eventually at some point you get from identifying with just yourself to identifying to the entire world uh, so the, there's a shift there that happens that you start to then uh, become more of service. So I feel like that and the long trajectory is where virtual reality is going to be going. You have this idea of personalized narrative such that um, right now you have just a narrative experiences that you're having, but what would it mean for you to have a narrative that's exactly for what you need to hear to be able to transform and to grow and evolve and to go to the next level? And I think that level of personalized narrative is a, a very difficult problem because right now we don't even know what types of experiences people want to have in virtual reality. But I think that the elemental theory and these different dimensions of presence will start to have at least some high level framework for being able to kind of decide what, what you enjoy, what's your temperament, and what type of experiences do you want to have. And then eventually, over time, we're going to see these interactive narratives that are really designed such that we're able to fully particip participate in a way that is just exactly for what we need and want. So uh, just as a review, I talked a little bit about the philosophical implications of VR. I think that um, people are having direct experiences talking about these deeper questions. Um, and I do think we're moving from the information age into the ex experiential age. And um, yeah, the elemental theory of presence, I think, is a really helpful framework for me, not only just understanding virtual the experiences that I have, uh, but also as I conduct interviews and talk about these things with these different creators. So if you're interested in learning more, you can check out the uh, Voices of VR podcast. I have about 500 episodes that I've published so far and have another 200 plus that I've recorded and will be coming out. Um, I'm supported by Patreon, so uh, have a listen and you can uh, just uh, donate there to help me continue to do this type of research. And I'm also working on the Ultimate Potential of Virtual Reality book, which should be coming out soon. And with that, I just wanted to thank you for uh, coming out today. Thank you.